On this episode of the Catholic Echo Podcast from the Diocese of Youngstown, we're talking about evangelization and missionary discipleship with Bishop David Bonner and Father John Michael Lavelle. Find more about this episode's topic, including articles from the Catholic Echo, at catholicecho.org slash podcast. And now, the host of the Catholic Echo Podcast, Father Jim Corda. Hello and welcome to the Catholic Echo Podcast. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is brought to you by the annual Dossison Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and Cumulus Media Youngstown. I'd like to welcome Bishop Bonner to our show. It's nice to see you again. It's always a joy to be here, Father Corda. You know, today, Bishop, we're going to talk about two words that really have been part of your pastoral leadership here in the Diocese of Youngstown since you started with us, and that is evangelization and missionary discipleship. We're going to focus first on evangelization. For us as Catholics, That's kind of a strange word because we shy away from that. When we hear evangelists, we think of a street corner preacher, and that's not exactly what it is. So explain to the folks that are with us, what exactly does evangelization mean? To evangelize is to share the good news. Mm -hmm. It's to tell the story of an encounter with Jesus Christ. You know, one of the great things that happened to me after I was named Bishop of Youngstown, I had to go on retreat, but it was during the time of the pandemic, all the retreat houses were closed. So I had to make some accommodation and had to find a retreat master. So I was led to reach out to all the bishops from Pittsburgh who originated from Pittsburgh and just wrote to them and said, can you give me some thought or some thoughts Mm -hmm. for me to have a retreat in anticipation of my ordination and installation as bishop? And one of the bishops wrote back to me and said, Dave, just read and pray over Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel. And he was a prophet because that was such wonderful advice because my whole focus as bishop has really been rooted in that document, which is a document about evangelization and missionary discipleship. It's about all of us working together to share the good news, to encounter Christ, and to walk with each other as that all unfolds. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, the one phrase that comes to mind when I think of joy of the gospel is Pope Francis's desire to bring back a new evangelization. So there's almost a a revitalization of what it's all about and what it all means for us to accompany one another on this journey to God's kingdom. So what is this new evangelization? What, What are some of the components? And does it harken back to the early days of the church when those evangelists who wrote down the words and the events and the life of Jesus. Does that harken back to that? And what does that do to move us forward? I think the new evangelization is an evangelization which is more intentional, Mm -hmm. personally intentional, that is shared by every follower of Jesus Christ. There's a need for every disciple to take ownership of that responsibility to proclaim the joy of the gospel. And it is an evangelization that is based not so much on a program Mm -hmm. or a document, but upon encounter. And it's one by one, people going forth and being more bold and intentional in sharing their encounter with Jesus Christ. So I think it's something that can happen wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus. You know, the one word that comes to mind is relationships, and that is basically what we are all about as Christians, is that we are in relationship with one another and relationship with God. You know, it's kind of like looking at the cross. The cross is vertical and it's horizontal. So we have a relationship with one another as followers of Jesus, but we also have a relationship with God who is the source of it all. So how do we have that cross in our lives? How does it become realistic for us as evangelists to have a relationship with one another? Well, it all begins at the altar where we encounter the source and summit of our faith, Jesus Christ. That's where we derive our energy, our zeal, our passion to go forth. That's where we receive the commission. We're sent out at every mass, go forth or go in peace, go and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. I think that it all begins there, but 
when we leave Mass, we really need to be as intentional as we can be in proclaiming the joy of the gospel, whether it's with our family member, our co-worker, or that stranger. I was in a store not too long ago where I was asking for help and I was wearing my collar and there was a little brief exchange of what do you do, who do you work for? And this person shared that she really does not belong to a faith that she prays. And all I simply said to her was, well, we all have our own journey, but we're on a journey together. I think that it's important that we acknowledge people, and even if they're different from us, even if they aren't of the same tradition. I mean, the evangelization takes us beyond our realm, but it also calls us to evangelize to one another as Catholics, because there's that phrase, lukewarm Catholics, and there's some who have just fallen away for whatever reason, hurt, disillusionment, just the ways of society. It's important that we evangelize without discrimination. Let's focus a little bit on missionary discipleship, because that is really kind of a new term for us as Catholics. An old term and yet a new term. What does the church mean and what does the Holy Father mean by being a missionary disciple? To be a missionary disciple is to follow Jesus Christ together and to go to the farthest corners of the world, the peripheries, and bring the good news. Pope Francis reminds us that it is a matter of, for those of us who are ordained, knowing the smell of the sheep. There's a closeness, there's a proximity. It's coming to know and feel their joy and their sorrow and helping them to see Christ in all of that. Obviously, through our baptism, we become missionaries. We become disciples. So that means in all that we do, all that we say, and how we live, that we keep in mind that we're doing His work It's interesting when you were talking about gathering for weekend liturgy and then we leave the church to go out into the world. Oftentimes, when we go from the church into the parking lot, we sometimes forget that challenge of the gospel that we've just heard, and we forget the fact that we are to accompany one another from the church in the parking lot, into our cars, out into the open. And so it's a conscious effort for us to do that. How difficult is it sometimes to not do it? I think that we are easily distracted as human beings. And you know, we come to church, and what's interesting for me is on Sundays, the processional cross leads us into the sanctuary. And that cross is reminiscent not only of Jesus' great love for us, his suffering and dying for us, but there's a sense in which that cross represents all the crosses that we have been carrying that week. That cross stays in the sanctuary, we hear God's word, we receive the sacrament, we enjoy the fraternity of being together, and then that same cross sends us out, representative of Christ's love for us, leading us, we follow that, but we go back and we carry those same crosses. If not our own, we help carry the crosses of others, but we're revitalized, we're replenished by word and sacrament. It seems so basic. But we can become so distracted, and our, our crosses can be so heavy that we miss the point. In our next segment, and the final segment, we're going to talk with Father Jack Lavelle, who is your vicar for missionary discipleship. Also, over the past year, there have been Eucharistic gatherings in different parishes around the diocese. What was the purpose of that, and how do you hope to continue that celebration? Well, as you know, we're in the midst of a Eucharistic revival, not to mention we're walking the synodal path that Pope Francis has set forth for us. But these moments, these Eucharistic moments, remind us of our source. But as they bring us together, they remind us that we're not alone in this effort and that we need each other and that we go forth together. Well, Bishop Bonner, as always, we appreciate your presence on our show, and we look forward to walking together and with one another as missionary disciples in the work of the Lord to our final resting place in his kingdom. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Corda. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Youngstown announces the commencement of our annual Season of Giving campaign. This annual 60-day campaign benefits those in need throughout the Diocese of Youngstown. To kick off Catholic Charities' season of giving on Tuesday, November 28th, the hashtag GivingTuesday online fundraiser will aim to collect more than $20,000 in just 24 hours. Thanks to Catholic Charities' corporate sponsors, all donations received online on hashtag GivingTuesday will be matched up to $10,000. The second annual Breakfast with the Bishop will also take place on Tuesday, November 28th from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish 
The event features a hearty breakfast, a brief presentation from Bishop David J. Bonner, and education stations highlighting Catholic Charities, ministries, and services. For more details, visit www.ccdoy.org slash season of giving or call 330-744-8451. If you have a story idea for the Catholic Echo magazine, podcast, or website, send an email to catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org. We'd love to hear your ideas. Welcome back to our show. Joining me is Father Jack LaBelle, who is the Vicar for Missionary Discipleship. Welcome to our show. It's great to be here. You know, we've just heard from Bishop Bonner about evangelization, missionary discipleship. We're going to talk about that in this segment and in the next one, but let's kind of define what evangelization is. For many of us Catholics, that's kind of a scary word. When we start talking about evangelists, we think of a, a street corner preacher, but that obviously is not the case. In your view and theologically, what are we talking about? The best definition would be simply to share the love that God has for us with everyone we encounter. But I think you are right. People find it so frightening. They do think of other faith traditions that they hear about this active evangelization. And one of the things that I think is perhaps unfortunate about many of us in the Catholic faith is we've been raised in the church to not force our religion on other people. We're very good at doing what we do within our building, within our parishes, within our own structures, and we just kind of feel that it stays there. And this sense of evangelization is to go out to all the world. I mean, it starts with what happened at the ascension, that before Christ ascended into heaven, he tells the apostles, go out to all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's not the work of just the first 11. It's not the work of just bishops or priests or those that are employed in churches. All of us are to do that. But I, I do think you're right. We've kind of, it's been ingrained in us that we kind of keep it to ourselves. And oftentimes, you know, when we talk about what the church says about this, we go back to what we learned as youngsters or what we year, learned years and years ago. But that evolves and that develops. You know, oftentimes people say, well, if I really want to know things, I'll see what the Pope says or what the bishop says or what my priests or the nuns say, but we are all the church. We are all the body of Christ, which means that through our baptism, we're called to be evangelizers. That word basically comes from telling the good news. And what is exactly the good news that we're talking about? Well, certainly we define the good news as beginning with the Gospels. Mm -hmm. These words that we have of Jesus himself and, and yet we see that it needs to go forth from that. But certainly it starts with that good news. We hear it every Sunday when we're at Mass. We can reflect on it. But what are the words of Jesus that are challenging us and guiding us and leading us? But then we certainly see that that good news has developed and gone into many other teachings and aspects of our life in the church. And so that very basic foundation of who Jesus is calling us to be, united with him. You know, as you were talking, an image comes to mind in those of us who work in parishes or have worked in parishes or parish priests, we know that once people leave the church, they go out into the parking lot, which sometimes is not a very happy and conducive arena for evangelization. How do you bridge that? How do you tell people, okay, the mass has ended, go in peace, go out to tell the good news, but when you're in the parking lot, you've got to carry that message there as well. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. In the sacristy of my parish, there are these two windows that look onto the back parking lot, and I've often commented that for me to be at peace to celebrate Mass, I need to put stained glass or at least get some blinds for those windows because I see everybody in the parking lot before, and this one fighting for this space and this one fighting for that space. And it's amazing how we do. We tell people to go out, and you know, one of the options at the end of Mass is to go in peace. Another is go and announce the Gospel. And I think that's what we need to challenge people to be about. How do we take what we have discovered in the celebration of the Mass and allow it to transcend all of our conversations, all of our activities? Yes, we might be racing back home. We might be running to work. How do we carry Jesus with us, that message of hope and the promise of peace? It's a challenge, but the challenge still needs to be there. And doesn't it start at home? Doesn't it start in families? You know, as you and I kind of look at our own growing up, 
in looking at our own families and then what was nurtured in us certainly is one of the reasons why we responded to the call to being a priest you know so that whole sense of getting that at home is really crucial and important what can we as church do for parents to make sure that that happens in the home i think one of the things and maybe it's the first thing and it's a challenge is to give them permission to be faith-filled. Mm. So many other things are fighting for their time and attention mm -hmm. of what they think it means to be a good parent. I have to have my kid in every sport, in every dance. We've got to run here, we've got to run there. I got to have a part-time job because this one wants this and this one needs that. Society and culture is now telling them they need to have all of this activity and all of these things and all this stuff in their lives for their kids and to be mm -hmm. good parents. And I think the very first thing we need to do is give them permission to just be faith-filled. And yes, we can hearken back to what we think was an easier time. No time is easy. But when you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, if you watch a movie from the 40s, 50s, 60s, you immediately know if within that movie the character is Catholic. Because if there's some scene in their kitchen or their living room or their dining room, you're going to see a crucifix. You're going to see a picture of the Pope at that time. All the homes that had a picture of John the 23rd or Paul the 6th. And yes, that was a little bit more of a sense of religiosity, but also reminded us that we're part of a larger family, that we are part of, of something greater than ourselves. And I think we've lost a little of that today, too. Pope Francis, enjoy the gospel, called for this hearken to and this back to a new evangelization. What is this new evangelization? Well, I think certainly, you know, we hear the word new. And so I'll preface it with this. We're always leery of a new program. Mm. You know, oh, now they want us to do this, or now they want us to do that. And there's always, my email is flooded with companies that because I have a title in this role, add water, stir, and you'll have 3,000 families in your parish, and it's not that easy. The new evangelization is not a program of old, but it is rediscovering who we are called to be at our very core and how we do go out in the world today. It is a new world, it's a new opportunity, and how do we bear witness to that loving and peaceful presence of Christ in the world? And really look for any opportunity to share the good news and to invite people along on the journey. You know, even in our catechetical programs, we don't talk about education, we don't talk about the formal school model. Catechesis of any model is to accompany one, to journey with one, to be there with one on the journey. So the new evangelization is really just looking at the world in which we're living in now, but how do we work together and move forward together toward the kingdom? We're going to talk more about that in a moment, but we need to take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Did you know that the Catholic Echo magazine is delivered 10 times per year to 52,000 Catholic households in Northeastern Ohio? That's more than 150,000 people. And the Catholic Echo website, catholicecho.org, has been averaging 30,000 views per month since it launched in February 2023. Advertise your business, special event, or service with the Catholic Echo in print or online. Email catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org. Advertising discounts are available for Catholic institutions as well as for businesses that commit to five or ten issues in a year. Email catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org or visit the Advertising tab at catholicecho.org for more information. Many sisters, brothers, and religious order priests served for little pay, and now their communities lack retirement funds. I spent 34 years as a teacher. I just loved interacting with the students. Gifts to the Retirement Fund for Religious help provide for medications, nursing care, and more. An annual collection is held in parishes across the nation. I always remember you in my prayers. Please give to those who have given a lifetime. Visit retiredreligious.org. Welcome back to our show. With me is Father Jack LaBelle, who is the Vicar for Missionary Discipleship. And that's what we want to focus on in our 
time now. What exactly is a missionary disciple? For us as a diocese, that was kind of a new title that you receive. What was behind all that? You mentioned the joy of the gospel, and certainly we see in that, which is now a near 10-year-old document, one of the first things that Pope Francis proclaimed when he became Pope in 2013. But he speaks about this, the endeavor of missionary discipleship. And certainly we're all called by virtue of our baptism to do that. And I think it is. It's a new term for people. Certainly discipleship should not be new. But that sense of missionary, that we are called to go out, to go out into the world, as I said in our earlier segment, really modeled after the apostles who went out. You know, they didn't just stay there with their heads looking up in the sky. They weren't paralyzed with this. And even in the early church, you know, they had no idea of when Jesus was going to come back. So maybe there was a little paralysis in the beginning. Maybe he meant now. Maybe he meant tomorrow. You know, and eventually the church needed to continue to go out. The apostles go out to all the nations. Our missionary effort may be going back into our homes. It's going into our workplaces, going into our schools, going into our community. And and again, not beating people over the head with our particular view of religion, but that overarching sense of who Christ is for us and the love that he compels us to share with others. I'd like to go back to that word that you talked in the last segment, and that is accompaniment. You know, it's really kind of a new concept for us, at least theologically in the church. It's an old idea, obviously, and we've done that for centuries, but what is this accompaniment and who do we accompany? Well, we're called to accompany each other, and part of it is to find each other or find others, ourselves, find others where they're at on the journey. I think a a beautiful sense of accompaniment goes back to the road to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. You know, there Jesus is just hours after the resurrection, and these two disciples, lost and forlorn, they had some sense certainly of who Jesus was. They were disciples, but things had changed. They had lost a little hope. He doesn't come and and berate them for what has happened in their journey, why they're getting out of town. He meets them where they're at. He offers them a way forward, staying with them, allowing them to discover their gifts and talents. You know, they invite him in. They're going to share a meal with him, and then he ends up being the host and being the one who shares with them. But it really is just that sense of meeting people where they're at, but then moving together toward the the ultimate goal of being disciples. And I love that gospel story about the road to Emmaus because it kind of combines the word and the Eucharist. You know, (laughs) Jesus broke open the scriptures to them, then they sat down and broke bread. You know, so there's that sense that for us as Catholics, we gather around the Eucharist, we gather around the table of the Word, we're fed with that, and we take those and we go out into the world and we hopefully accompany one another on our journey. I know this past year that in the diocese there was what we call the Eucharistic Revival. Talk briefly about that, but where has that gone and where is it going? Well, it came out of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops efforts to re-engage people with an understanding of the Eucharist. So again, we go back to the word revival, kind of like evangelization. We might think of, you know, non-denominational churches and those old tent revivals and coming to town. But revival is simply that, to revive, to give new life and new focus to what is already there. So there's already a a focus on the Eucharist, but to re-engage. And so they've actually called for a three-year Eucharistic revival, which we're in the middle of the second year. The first year was the diocesan year, and we went to every one of our counties. We had masses and processions of the Eucharist. We then revisited those counties and celebrated holy hours, something we need to re-engage with a little more. I've discovered we're not good with silence. We like to fill it with prayers and songs, but we need to learn to just sit back in the presence of the Lord and reflect and pray. And now we come to this second year, and so we are encouraging parishes to invite those same activities throughout the year. And then it culminates at the end of next year with a National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis. And let's talk about that Eucharist and how important that is for us as Catholics. But then there's something that's really what we call the March of the Eucharist, which was an old book that listed all of the parishes at that time in the Diocese of Youngstown during this particular year, and that is something that's going to be revived again. Talk briefly about that. Well, certainly the Eucharist, as we hear in our teaching, is the source and summit of who we are, that great gift that Christ left us, his own body and his own blood, to nourish us and nurture us. 
And so in 1951, we were just about eight years old as a, a diocese, our first bishop, Bishop McFadden. He compiled a book that its full title is The March of the Eucharist from Dungannon. And that from Dungannon is simply that that is the oldest parish established in what is now the Diocese of Youngstown in 1817 in Dungannon, what became known as St. Philip Neri. But in that book, as you mentioned, there's a picture, nice etching, and then a brief history of each of the parishes that existed in the diocese up to 1951. We have parishes that didn't make the book because they were established after as we were still growing into the late 60s. We now see that we've had many parishes that have merged and been renamed. So we really wanted with this whole focus on the Eucharist and that beautiful theme, you know, he could have given it any title, but the March of the Eucharist, that that's who we are. We are a Eucharistic people going forward, that we now are going to redo the book, an updated version, and it's gonna be a digital form. We may print one, but more digital so that everyone can access it. And it will be the March of the Eucharist continues and who we are today. And and why the digital form might be so nice is the church is always changing. It's always evolving. It's always moving. And once we print a book, it's stagnant. You print something and it's out of date the next day. But we can constantly update this and engage our parishioners across the six counties. And basically that whole image of we are pilgrims on the way to the kingdom. And so I I like that image. What I'd like us to talk about is something that I think is rather difficult, and that is the reason why a lot of people since the pandemic have not returned to church. We know that's a reality. That's not only in our Catholic churches, but that's all over in many denominations. Is there any reason why, in your estimation, or what are we as a church doing and diocese to talk about that. I talked about giving parents permission to witness to their faith and to be faith-filled. The pandemic gave people permission to disengage with the physical participation and celebration of the Mass. One of the things the Diocese of Youngstown has had for many, many years is our Mass for shut-ins, which is there for people who truly need it. And I don't want to sound, you know, flippant, but it frustrates me when people will say, I need the Mass for shut-ins, but they're telling me that when I run into them at the grocery store or at the mall or at my nephew's soccer game. And I'm thinking, Church is the only thing that you have not fully engaged with. You know, we are almost three and a half years. I know that sounds so odd, but we are almost three and a half years since we returned to church on Pentecost Sunday in 2020. And we need to really engage more. So the Mass for shut-ins is a beautiful thing. My grandmother used to watch it faithfully laying in bed or laying on the couch when she could not get there. But we need to really work at people re-engaging and being part of the family, part of the community. We gain so much when we're with and for each other, and that's just been lost. And I think people have just gotten out of practice. And I think if they were honest with themselves, they would see that they've re-engaged with other aspects of community they need to re-engage with their church family. And it's very important. Relationships matter, people matter, and it's important for us to be together, as you say, as church, as the body of Christ. Thank you for your presence on our show today. For those of you who would like to listen to this podcast again or get more information, you can visit us at catholicecho.org. The Catholic Echo Podcast is a production of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Youngstown in cooperation with Cumulus Media Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Have a blessed day, and may God be with you.